racial and environmental justice in South Carolina. And the title is The Struggle for Equitable Access to Safe Water. I'm so happy to have you join us today for this special event. I want to give thanks to our committee and to our guest speaker for being with us today from the South Carolina Environmental Law, and Law Project. And if we have any ladies from national, we want to welcome them also today. Our charter policies were adopted in 1952 and updated in 1962. And they emphasize the awareness of the needs for equitable, for equal education, housing, employment, medical care, and environmental justice for all members of the community. So today we are looking at racial and environmental justice, especially clean water for all communities, but for the community, the state, the nation, and the world. We participated in the Mississippi Project and now we're emphasizing South Carolina. So whenever we talk about protection of water, water is an integral part of God's radical expression of God's love for all humanity. Water cannot be monopolized or privatized. It is to be shared like air, light, and earth. It is God's elemental provision Revival, all God's children on this planet. The people called United Methodists shall urge all governments to make transparent community centered decisions about water use. We will continue with our program. Is Vicky Val on? Sorry, ladies, forgot to unmute. I am going to read this morning our scripture from Ezekiel 34, verse 18. It is not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, but you also trample the rest of your pasture with your feet. It is not enough for you to drink clear water, you must also muddy the rest of your feet. And if you would join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us learn about this need of clean drinking water for our brothers, sisters, and children in our community and in communities around the world. Please help us to find a way to provide clean water for those in need. Please educate us on the need of clean water in our community, but be with those in the need and help guide us to do your work and help us to answer all the prayers that are needed for this mission and other missions of the United Women in Faith throughout the world. Lord, also be with those that are suffering and in need. Lord, you know their needs. Please be with the families of the five explorer, explorers who were lost earlier this week. Lord, we ask all of this in your holy name we pray. Amen. We'll start with the litany. Because we believe. That God is the creator of all people and all of God's children is one family. Because we believe that racism is rejection of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Because we believe that racism denies the redemption and reconciliation of Jesus Christ. Because we believe that racism robs all human beings of, of their wholeness and is used as a justification for social, economic, environmental, and political exploitation. Because we believe that we must declare before God and before one another that we have sinned against our siblings of other races in thoughts, in words, and in deed. Because we believe that is our common humanity in creation, 
all people are made in God's image and all people are equally valuable in the sight of God. Because we believe that our strength lies in our racial and cultural diversity and that we must work towards a world in which, in which each person's value is respected and nurtured. Because we believe that our struggle for justice may be based on new attitudes, new understanding, new relationships, and must be reflected in the laws, policies, structures, and practices of both church and state. Because we believe we commit ourselves as individuals, as a community to follow Jesus Christ in word and in deed, and to struggle for the rights and the self-determination of every person and groups of persons. Because we believe, because we, believe we commit. We commit. Amen. Amen. It is my pleasure today to welcome our guest speaker, Ben Cunningham, Senior Managing Attorney with the South Carolina Environmental Law Project. Mr. Cunningham graduated from the University of Georgia and earned his JD from Mercer University Walker F. George School of Law. He worked in private practice in Georgia and South Carolina until he started working for the South Carolina Environmental Law Project in May of 2019. Some of his cases include helping to provide access to safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water for rural communities. He is also working on behalf of the Friends of Gadsden Creek challenging DHEX authorization to fill and destroy one of the last tidal creeks on the Charleston Peninsula. Ben has a passion for preserving South Carolina's natural resources for future generations. He loves the outdoors and spending time with his wife, Jana, and son, Felix. We are delighted to have you as our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for inviting me and Skelp. And uh, it's just great to be here with you this morning and such a great turnout. And it's really an honor. Um, before I get started, let me see if I can share my screen because I've got a little, here we are, PowerPoint. And let's start from the beginning. Here we are. Okay. Um, uh, first, a little bit about our organization, SCELP, South Carolina Environmental Law Project. It was established by Jimmy Chandler back in the late 90s. And, you know, when Jimmy established it, he, I think, thought, well, I can just do a few things and then DHEC can kind of take over and we'll be good in South Carolina. And that has not proven to be the case. And it seems like we've got more and more issues than even we did back then. But what we are is a nonprofit organization that provides legal services to other nonprofits, to other community groups, to sometimes individuals. And we work on, uh, our mission is to work on behalf of the uh, public trust resources in the state of South Carolina, preserve them. And, you know, it, it, our cases, one of the main criteria is it has to be in the public interest. And so we cover the whole state. We've got offices. Uh, I'm, I'm in the Mount Pleasant office in Charleston County, but we've got offices in Georgetown where it started. We've got offices in Greenville and Columbia, trying to uh, spread out over the state and address uh, a lot of the issues throughout the state. And is, uh, what are those issues? We mainly focus on these, although these are this is not an exhaustive list. Coastal management, which often means how um, beaches are handled, uh, public beaches, which are a public trust resource for everybody. And we're trying to preserve that so that we can have beaches because a lot of the solutions that get floated around to address flooding or address um, what's increasingly an issue because of climate change, global warming and sea level rise really results in beach removal, not beach preservation. Uh, water, uh, of course, we're going to talk about today in wetlands, which are intimately uh, associated with clean water because they uh, form a filtration. So they're almost like cleanups, even though they look like uh, they might look a little 
yucky. Uh, they actually filter a lot of pollutants out of the water and they help their kind of nature's way to clean water. And uh, the more we remove wetlands for development, uh, the, the less filtration that nature does for us. Uh, we, we address wildlife habitat conservation, which can go hand in hand with a lot of this stuff, like for example, wetland fill, uh, you know, a lot of species need wetlands for habitat. Uh, landfill, nuclear toxic waste, uh, that's a, a big issue too. I'm working on a case right now uh, related to the nuclear aspects in Savannah Riverside. Um, so those are just some of the areas that, that we cover, but those are probably some of the more typical areas. And as you can see here, we've got cases all over the state. Uh, these are, and I will say, these are just our active cases. We actually have uh, more issues that we work on too that aren't necessarily legal cases, but uh, like for instance, one of the ones is rural drinking water that I've been working on for a few years now. And that's not a, a lawsuit, but it is involved in uh, how water is provided throughout the state. And it's, it requires a lot of work. We've got you know, even probably multiple dozen issues that are ongoing. Now, what is environmental justice? Uh, you know, these days, I think a lot of people have a somewhat of a better understanding of what that is. Um, back in the 90s, um, there was an executive order issued by President Clinton to take it into consideration and, and in certain federal decisions. But uh, I think more and more, it's become a more uh, widespread topic, uh, both uh, in politics, but also in how land and land use is controlled on a local level. Um, and simply put, environmental justice, the way I think about it anyway, is fairness and involvement, fair treatment, meaningful involvement for everybody, regardless of race, color, origin, income, anything. Everyone deserves a seat at the table. And that, as you all, I'm sure, are aware, often did not happen uh, for many years. And fair treatment, basically, that means is that for the longest time, there wasn't any. Uh, he, and and uh, a, lot of a lot of times that had the, the result was siting decisions of large, uh, for example, power plants, industrial plants, landfills on the doorstep of vulnerable communities, people that uh, did not have political clout or economic clout to stop those kinds of decisions. And they get saddled with uh, the environmental consequences uh, and other, other folks benefit from that because they don't have to deal with it. And unfortunately, it kind of starts a ripple effect where if you cite one thing in an area, then the idea is, well, we'll just cite everything there. And that disproportionately uh, affects the community there who's dealing with it. Now, here's some information is well-documented. Vulnerable communities are often located in dangerous areas like floodplains. They have to deal, deal with flooding. They have to deal with air pollution, noise pollution, uh, other kinds of toxic wastes. And that affects, of course, quality of life, uh, there was an article in the New York Times this past week, in fact, about uh, noise pollution and how it can cause uh, heart issues. And so all these kinds of things affect quality of life for communities and, and often vulnerable communities, communities of color. And we at Scalp, and as part of our strategic plan, have decided to focus on some of those environmental justice aspects that haven't been taken into account uh, appropriately, we think, in our state so far. And this is just kind of a representation. And, and this is, you know, what we do essentially is give voice to the community in a legal context. Uh, and, and it's the community's voice that we get to try and echo and amplify uh, to decision makers, to courts, to the legislature, um, whatever the context. And a lot of our cases have environmental justice um, aspects to them, but some more so than others. And I'm going to talk about a few of those. And these are not just cases, they're actually issues as well. 
or rural drinking water. Uh, this is something I've been working on for a long time. This is a big issue, and I, I like that the uh, title of the presentation was a struggle. It uses the word struggle in it uh, because it is a struggle. It is going to be a struggle um, and a continual struggle. It's not like something that we can just say, well, we solved it and, and we're good. Uh, this is going to be something that we're always going to have to fight for and guard against degradation of. So basically the idea is that everyone, every, every person, and certainly everyone in this state, has a right to clean drinking water. Uh, you know, it's, as, as the speaker said uh, in discussing this topic, it's essential. It's, you know, it's, a fundamental tenet of fairness of to treat everybody that way and also to treat you know creation that way. So what have we done with rural drinking water and what kind of aspects of this would we address directly? Um, first, there is the um, let's see if I can advance the slide here. Why are we not advanced? Hmm. There we go. Palisan, uh, you guys may have recall some reports of this. This has been a little while ago. Uh, Denmark has had water issues uh, for a while. And the, the city of Denmark, uh, part of the drinking water was supplied by certain wells. And one of the wells was contaminated and they started using a product called halisan in it to disinfect it. And the problem was, is that halisan wasn't ever cleared for drinking water uh, disinfection. It's often used in pools or fountains to disinfect, uh, but drinking water was something a little bit beyond the scope of what halisan had been envisioned to do. It was very low cost, but uh, in fact, they tried to do this in North Carolina. In North Carolina, the environmental department said, no, you can't do it. Well, in South Carolina, they do it here and it goes through uh, until uh, there was enough concern that it, it became known that Hal Sand was not registered under FIFRA, a federal um, uh, it's, uh, insecticide. Uh, fungicide Redenticide uh, Registration Act and Flimson issued a stop work order. And this was after 10 years of use in the city of Denmark. And, you know, there is a lawsuit about this right now, a um, um, class action lawsuit. And here, let's see if I can get this to play. Oh, come back here. There's some video about it. We had a great problem here on the kind of the water system. We couldn't drink the water. We had to buy water. The water was real black. It was gas. We don't know what the water is doing to you. They should have just did something with this water system and not let it got this far. Everybody buying water here in Denmark, which they should not have to be buying water when the water should be pure. So, uh, is it calibrated? Yeah. Check, check the standard seven again, just make sure it's reading. We came to Denmark, South Carolina, because the residents had compiled a very convincing case that the water here was not safe to drink. We're actually collecting lead samples across the city, as we did in Flint, Michigan. One of the things we've already concluded, the pH is just way too low. It's far too acidic. It's definitely going to cause some lead problems in some homes. There should be treatment to raise the pH higher and how on earth this has been allowed to continue, I'm not sure, because it's also destroying their city pipes. I started noticing problems, well, long after I leave it with the kitchen and stuff, but I thought it was maybe like, maybe I thought maybe it was the soap I was using, but then I start changing up different soaps and then I find out it wasn't a soap because a lot of time when I went to turn the water on in the bathroom, the kitchen, the water was brown. And so I would have rash around my neck and then my hair, it's all in the top. It's all I hear in the top. Oh. You got no hair? Yes, I'm concerned about it because how would you put chemicals in the water and then you don't know how much you can put in there 
and then you're risking people's lives and people get sick, like I've lost my hair and stuff, and I just think it's not right for us to have to have go through something like that. It's not about money. It's about us having okay. the freedom. Yeah. 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 We see every Thursday morning every month. We got a crowd here tonight because you got something on the agenda of interest to you. What was the water issue? These other 11 months. Each time. Answer. We're going to get water. I need water from city supply. Every day, and uh, so we we are going to have a debate about this. What we're going to do is what we were charged with responsibility to do it, and that is making sure that our water is of a high quality. And we're going to use every resource available to do that. So uh, let me give you a little bit of update about what's going on in Denmark. Uh, you know, as you can see from that video, once trust is lost in a public water, uh, drinking water system, it's really hard to regain it. And as I said before, there is a class action lawsuit ongoing, which kind of complicated against both uh, the city and DHEC, I believe. I know DHEC's involved as a defendant, so it kind of complicates what DHEC is willing to do, I think, to address it. Now, we, as part of our petition for rulemaking, we asked them to close a little loophole where uh, you don't have to necessarily uh, confirm that uh, any kind of chemical cleaning agent or disinfectant is uh, FIFRA approved. They did not agree to change the regulation, but they did agree to include some changes in some of the guidance documents and the application materials. So that will not happen again. Now, of course, there are also, as, as was mentioned in the video, some kind of more infrastructural issues as far as the age of the pipes and that sort of thing. And that's going to be something that I hope some of the money that has been allocated recently from the federal government uh, for environmental justice type concerns and particularly drinking water can be used to address. But this is uh, kind of a classic issue where there was a loss of trust. And now, uh, because of uh, what's happened before, people still are uh, fearful of drinking the water there. And you can uh, provide them with test results, but you know, once the trust is gone, the trust is gone. So that's what's going on right now in Denmark uh, to be continued basically. Now, we also, as part of our petition for rulemaking and uh, encouraged DHEC to promulgate the new lead and copper rules that it, the EPA had recently uh, finalized. And they did, uh, you know, within a few weeks of our petition, they, they put out a notice of drafting about that. But before that, uh, in small, low income and sometimes uh, vulnerable racially diverse communities, there was a lot of lead issues from, uh, we, we did a FOIA request from DHEC and found that, you know, at least 48 systems had exceeded the action level for lead, including Head Start facility, dozens of other children. Uh, you know, it was a, it is a continual problem. The new lead rules uh, have what's called a trigger level that's lower than the action level beforehand. So. And it requires certain things to be done to try and address lead uh, content in water, such as what's called corrosion control technology, where you treat the water to basically try and stop the lead from leaching into the water from the pipes. And also uh, kind of more fundamentally lead service line replacement, which means you just dig up the pipes and take the pipes that have the lead in them out to get the lead out of the water. And again, there's a lot of money coming in to all the states, but in the state too, for lead service line replacement. And the sooner the better, because we all know how bad lead is, particularly for children in the water. So that has been done. The Biden administration, by the way, is reviewing that lead rule and uh, may increase the protections and lower some of those limits. PFAS, uh, this has been very much in the news. PFAS is 
uh, per and polyfluoral uh, alkyl substances. They are used in a, and have been used in a variety of products uh, from Teflon to Gore-Tex to cosmetics to any, you know, anything that's basically waterproof for a long time is made out of PFAS because it repels water. And it has been known for many years, but only more recently uh, in, in a more widespread manner of all the issues that can uh, come from PFAS exposure that occurs when you either eat something that is contaminated with PFAS or ingest something that has to be normally like drinking water. And here is a video that should explain a little bit more about PFAS. Perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS compounds, are man-made carbon and fluorine-based chemicals. PFAS compounds are incredibly resistant to breaking down. Since the early 1940s, PFAS has been used in various consumer and industrial products, including protective coatings, waterproof fabrics, and firefighting foam. Their resistance to heat, oil, and water is what makes them so useful. There are hundreds of known compounds, each with varying uses in our daily lives. PFAS compounds don't occur in nature, and it takes a significantly longer time for these compounds to break down in the environment and in the human body. The CDC's Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry says PFAS contamination has the potential to affect growth, learning, and behavior of infants and older children. It could lower a woman's chance of getting pregnant, and it could increase the risk of cancer. In February 2019, the Environmental Protection Agency released its PFAS Action Plan, which includes guidelines for PFAS contamination testing. In Alaska, the Department of Environmental Conservation started to test drinking water for five PFAS compounds in 2018. That was reduced to just two compounds in April before a recent memorandum by the DEC announced that the state would now test for all 18 compounds recommended by the EPA. Scientists are still learning about how PFAS exposure affects human health, but regulations to reduce their use and testing water for contamination is the first step toward understanding how to combat what are known as forever chemicals. Um, so what we did, let me see if I can get this on here. Uh, what we did, uh, I got a call a couple of years ago from a woman in, um, in, in near, well, I'm trying to think of how, how much I want to talk about it. Um, she lives in a rural area, uh, and she had gotten some test results from the EPA. And it turns out that the private well that she was drinking out of, she and her family were drinking out of, uh, was contaminated by PFOS. This is in the Florence area. It's actually Darlington. And she hadn't done anything. Uh, the PFOS was coming from uh, the farm across the street. And the farm wasn't created. Creating people, it was just using uh, sludge for fertilizer. Unfortunately, the sludge had come from an industrial facility and was contaminated with PFOS and it was contaminating their groundwater. And so we got involved uh, to try and get DHEC to set some limits on PFOS and sludge that is contaminating drinking water because the private wells, but also. Uh, through surface waters, uh, because PFOS gets discharged into surface waters or the sludge can run off into surface waters. And then the surface waters are used, one, one it can infect, contaminate fish, but also those surface waters are used as drinking water um, sources. And we're still working with DHEC. They said, first, we don't, we don't have the authority. And then we worked with them for over a year. And now they said, well, we do have the authority. Uh, the EPA is this, uh, states announced some draft MCLs for certain PFOS, which are well, virtually zero almost. They're at the level of detection of four parts per trillion. And the, the 
So that's going to be in effect for all drinking water um, providers to uh, comply with shortly. And so that's going to be good, but it's still all these places need cleaning up. And also that's not going to help those who just rely on wells for their drinking water. To that end, several public um, water providers had filed suit against some of the PFOS manufacturers. And just last week, there was a deal announced where 3M, one of the manufacturers, agreed to pay up to $12.5 billion to fund cleanups in various public water systems throughout the country. And earlier, I think DuPont, Camours, and others had agreed to pay $1.1 billion for cleanup. Uh, and the federal government, I think, is also going to kick in some money because cleanup is very expensive. Kind of the problem is, is that these chemicals are so durable. Uh, it's hard to uh, get rid of them once they are cleaned up. And that's what other scientists are working on. There's some recent uh, good news on that. Now we're continuing. I've got a meeting with DEC in the next two weeks to see what they're going to do. Uh, moving forward. This is a topic that's a big issue. Um, the, the department is taking it seriously, although I wish they'd move faster, but we are going to be continually engaged on this. All right, Gadsden Creek. I just <laughs> have a lot of war about Gadsden Creek. For those of you who uh, maybe aren't in around the Charleston area, this is, this is as you can see from this Photograph Gadsden Creek. There is a uh, public housing community right across the street called Gadsden Green. Gadsden Creek was uh, once enormous, uh, and it and its tidelands took up about 95 acres along the west west edge of Charleston's peninsula in the west side community. Uh, they did, and this is all that remains. Uh, because many decades ago, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the city of Charleston decided to fill up those tidelands and part of the creek with trash to make more land to be built for predominantly for white families. Um, that, of course, put a dump right on the doorstep of a predominantly African American community. And this is uh, what you can see, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and that's where we are. Uh, you know, now they want to develop over that land that they created from the marsh that causes flooding because it took away the marsh and that, uh, that there are some allegations about some issues from contamination from the landfill, which the city created. And now the, the developer is using that as an excuse to basically to continue the, the job and fill in Gadsden Creek, which was very important to that community uh, because it's basically the last vestige of this kind of way of life for that area in Charleston. Uh, we are fighting that. We have, um, and this is kind of a better picture of the creek, uh, that it's still a, a tidal creek and it has crabs and oysters and everything else right there in downtown Charleston. It's kind of a miracle despite everything else and they want to get rid of it. We have, but th this part of it, uh, we have challenged the permit that allows it to be filled. Uh, and the ALC, which was not a surprise, ruled against us. We have appealed to the Court of Appeals. That's fully briefed. We uh, like our chances. But meanwhile, the community is uh, continuing to fight against it in the city of Charleston. And in fact, just yesterday, I believe, in the Post and Courier, there was an op-ed published. Uh, we represent Friends of Gadsden Creek. We've been working with them on this for years. Also, the Charleston Area Justice Ministry. Uh, has been become involved and has really taken the baton and run with it. They are very engaged and they represent a network of several dozen churches in the Charleston area. And this is one of their primary environmental justice issues. So, you know, this is a water issue, but it's all kind of a recreational water issue. But um, this is far from over. And there is a continuing effort to try to educate the city council about alternatives that would allow Gaston Creek to be uh, maintained and even enhanced. Uh, so that's something that's we're continuing to work on and very engaged on. 
Bramlett, this is an upstate uh, case in the southern side community of Greenville. This area, uh, Duke kind of controls it, but for the longest time, nothing was going on with Bramlett. Uh, it's it's near a predominantly you know vulnerable African American community, and when Duke was sampling for any contamination, they just weren't looking in the right spots. Then we got involved a few years ago and had some sampling done, and lo and behold, we found some contamination. Uh, this is a little bit more about the Bramlett situation. Two sites were dealt with entirely differently. The one on Broad Street uh, ultimately was excavated to the bedrock. And today, it's got some beautiful new apartment building sitting right on top of it. Now, the one on Bramlett Street, on the other hand, it has been uh, neglected. Since I've been here, I've had an unusual number of deaths. The prevalence of cancers or other chronic issues um, caused me to wonder what the source of that was and why such a concentration in this particular area. After the facility closed down, you know, without a doubt, there were lots of folks, especially kids, who came into direct contact with this material. The main discharge source for the contamination is this ditch that emptied into the Reedy River. The older folks remembered playing in this ditch, which they took to be a natural water body and would come out and would be you know, up to their waist in this black, slick black sludge. It was discolored to me. We had a film on it when you came out. We didn't know what was done. There was an area that you couldn't get in because they said it was sinking ground. You would go, go down there. They would come up to your knees. I lived here for 21 years, and we played all over this area, in the woods, in the water, in the tar. Born up in this neighborhood, we were not aware that this was hazardous to our health. And some people were shocked and surprised that we had grown up with this environmental issue. There were challenges for us. And they still are because we don't have the means to, to fight large corporations that, uh, that are doing these things to our environment. That reflects the level of disregard from the greater uh, community that was shown for Southern Side. And Duke has done some sediment testing in the river uh, at the end of the ditch and has found contaminated sediment. The contamination going into the river means that. The same carcinogens that are in Southern Side are going into the river, going over the waterfall in Falls Park, going through downtown, heading down to Lake Conesty, down to, to Cedar Shoals where people are, are recreating in the water. So the environmental impact expands broadly and it impacts not only humans, but, but wildlife downstream to contamination. Living in the richest country in the world, you would think that citizens are protected from those types of hazards and dangers in their community, regardless of what side of town you live in. You've got an example of what we call an environmental justice problem. At one side on an affluent, rich side of town, it's thoroughly treated and dealt with appropriately. You have this side where a quarter century goes by since the problem was recognized, still effective actions not been taken to fix it. I do not want any child growing up with the environmental issues that we grew up with. So we're going to do something to make sure that other children don't grow up with that same issue. 
the Mr. Duke Powell has left in our community since I was a child. And I am adamant about their cleaning it up. I want to see this a healthy community. Quintessential, um, quintessential environmental justice issue in Bramlett. And, you know, so what's going on right now is, let's see, here we go. Uh, after the sampling was provided to DHEC and Duke, Duke is now engaged, well, first they agreed to a voluntary cleanup contract. But before they actually do any of the cleanup, they have to do a feasibility study. And that's what we're waiting on right now. What's kind of complicating the issue is, is it's not just the Duke issue. Uh, over this, uh, another entity basically ran for a long time an unregulated um, CND dump where they put a lot of construction debris Same. over it. So that has to be excavated before you can even get to a lot of the... Um, the, the coal uh, gas uh, pollutants. Uh, so that's kind of a complicating factor, but it is something that we are monitoring and continue to be engaged on and will continue to be engaged on to try to force these actors to treat this community as well as the other community. Uh, so that is most of my presentation. Now, I will say this. Um, we're gonna have some Q and A right now, but I would encourage everybody to stay engaged. Uh, you know, certainly we are happy to engage with communities. Uh, we're happy to engage with you all. Um, uh, we we have a very active social media, and and you know we're, we're happy to to work with any community groups to further this issue. One, one that we did do, and I think this is, uh, bears mentioning too, is it's not just about involvement, it's about having laws that require these kinds of decisions to take environmental justice considerations into consideration. We had a case where we were fighting a pipeline in Pamplico, and DHEC has all this community engagement and a lot of the citizens, uh, it's an African community, uh, African American community, say we don't want another pipeline in our community. And then DX says, "Well, that we understand that, but we can't take environmental justice uh, concerns into our water quality certification decision." And so it's not just enough to have involvement. The fairness is going to require some change in the laws and any kind of support. It's going to take a broad uh, coalition uh, to get that done. And so uh, I just encourage you all, if this is something that uh, affects you or you're interested in, we're happy to engage with you on. And I'm also happy to answer any questions now. Uh, I don't know. I probably should have said this uh, during this presentation, but um, we're, we're going to have about 10, 15 minutes to talk about this. And uh, I see some of the, you're happy to either just type them in the chat bo uh, box or if you want to just uh, come off mute, I'm happy to answer any questions. One question I did see is, are our services pro bono? Yes. We are a nonprofit and, you know, we, it, de it depends on the project, but by and large, we, we are not charging our clients fees. We, our, our organization um, pays us attorneys to represent people. That's kind of the point is that a lot of these community groups can't afford lawyers. Uh, and that's what we're here for, to give them a voice. And so our fee, uh, we don't charge fees. Um, some for, for some groups that are more well healed, we might split some expenses if needed. But by and large, uh, we don't even do that. And by and large, it's just... Uh, pro bono completely. Uh, we do have a newsletter and website. I'd encourage you all to go to scalp.org, uh, which uh, and our communications team, which uh, 
help put this presentation together is great. They they have big social media presence, newsletter, websites, and we're happy to engage with everybody about uh, on that level. We have a big event. If you're in the Georgetown area, would like to be in the fall. Um, it's called Wild Side. It's a big fundraiser, and, and you know we certainly. It, to the extent anybody wants to help us out financially, they, they don't have to wait till then, but we're always happy to, to have all the help we can get so we can provide services throughout the state. Uh, but, but if you're not able to, that's fine too. It, just engagement is really useful. Uh, and, and telling us what issues are going on in your communities. Uh, you know, we, even though we're all over the state and we try to monitor as much as we can, uh, we we're certainly don't claim to know what, everything that's going on. Uh, so if you or neighbors have something that's up, please contact us. We have an online help request form that people can fill out to let us know what's going on. And, you know, sometimes we aren't able to help folks because uh, maybe something's too far gone or maybe something's not ready yet, or maybe it's just doesn't quite meet the, our criteria for involvement. Uh, but we're happy to review all kinds of requests and we get dozens of help requests on, you know, probably hundreds throughout the year at least. So, all right, let's see, what else? Uh, so DHEC said they could not take environmental justice consideration. Yes, I did say that. They they said that explicitly. DHEC has an environmental justice coordinator, but most of the um, work that they do is community engagement which is important, don't get me wrong, and I'm glad they have that. And it's important for the community to be engaged. But unless you can also take environmental justice considerations uh, into uh, account when you're making a decision, engagement's only halfway there. You've got the other half is the fairness part. And yeah, I think for there to be true fairness, you need to have, um, regulations and or maybe even a, a state statute to do that. Now, one thing that has happened recently, the Biden administration just issued another executive order on environmental justice and about coordination among uh, the executive branch on environmental justice concerns and considerations and federal actions, which is really important. Uh, it's a, a big step in furthering environmental justice considerations. But, and, and the way that could affect some state decisions is if federal dollars are tied to certain state actions, then you know the states, I think, will also have to have an environmental justice uh, evaluation. So uh, that's all good. A lot of states have passed environmental justice legislation, uh, like I think New Jersey, Virginia, and I think it's important that maybe South Carolina join their ranks soon and not just rely on the federal government to handle it. Uh, there is a recording of this presentation. I'm not sure. I, I believe those who are running this um, forum can give you some information about how to access it. Are there any other questions out there uh, about any of the issues that we touched on today? I know it's a lot uh, to, that we covered. Ben, there was one that you skipped up oh, on the Virginia sorry. Tech. I'm students in the video and they wondered if there were others. Um, internships or student. Let me see what it said. I uh, see that. Other, okay. You have other student We We do have interns who work for us. Now, Virginia Tech, uh, Mark did, does a lot of water testing and did a lot of water testing in Flint. That's a very Virginia Tech based um, initiative. We have interns. Uh, we have a lot of law students who come intern for us. We've got some right now, and we also have some undergrads who intern for us. Uh, but again, we're we're doing the legal work uh, for a lot of this. Now, that doesn't mean we don't work with experts. We certainly do. Uh, we worked with biohabitats. We've worked with about some other issues. I've worked with engineers, uh, uh, geologists. Uh, we have a lot of a network of people that we rely upon because, you know, we can't be experts on anything. We're just going to try and work on the law part. They have to help us with the, the expertise they have on some of the factual issues. So uh, we have internships, but I think other, um, I know a lot of universities have a lot of in, 
internships and considerations. And even like stuff like DNR uh, does a lot of great work uh, in the state. So yeah, I'd encourage you all uh, and anybody else who's in interested in this sort of thing to reach out to some universities about internship opportunities. There's another question that was asked. Do you know if Duke Energy started the cleanup on the Bramlett project? No, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, my understanding is uh, that they are, they have yet to complete the feasibility study. And that once they do that, then presumably they will, uh, and, and I think that the purpose behind the feasibility study is to evaluate different alternatives and and see how much they would cost, how effective they would be, and then choose one uh, that would work to clean up the site. They have not, to my knowledge, published the feasible, the results of the feasibility study as yet. So everyone's waiting on that to occur. And then once that occurs, then presumably, hopefully, there'll be some time for public comment on that, or at least engagement from our side and, and the citizens of the community. And then hopefully we can move forward with finally cleaning up that news. Okay, and uh, then, we'll, then one more question. Can someone contact your agency to gain knowledge on environmental issues in their district? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we we have, and, and really, what we do is we take information in. If there is an environmental issue that we're working on in your area, we certainly would be happy to share that with you. Our website does a pretty good job of kind of outlining and explaining uh, some of our various projects that we have right now. But uh, also, kind of, we can explain what we're doing, but more of the point, if if you all are aware of an issue, uh, let us know. Uh, that's how you know, we, we often get people uh, contacting us, both from our partner organizations, like, for example, Upstate Forever or the Coastal Conservation League or the Sierra Club or the South Carolina Wildlife Federation or Audubon or you know, all kinds of uh, those types of organizations, but also community groups like Friends of Gadsden Creek, who I'm working with, or I'm working right now with uh, the 10 Mile uh, Neighborhood Association, uh, trying to address some development issues they're having in their community. So now I see some other questions popping up. Human yeah. body, the liver filter out some of the lead and other toxins. There, the human body can and does filter out some of the toxins. Thank goodness. Um, the problem is, is that. And in the filtration process, it takes a while, one. And for example, PFAS, uh, that, those chemical compounds are so persistent, both in the environment and the body, that there's this kind of a buildup of a, of a load that you know, can, can over, overwhelm the defenses in the filtration. And that's kind of the point of what's why we have um, health, uh, basically what's called maximum contaminant levels for some of these toxins in our drinking water uh, so that we don't get so much in our body that it overwhelms the filtration. Oh, let's see. All right. Then another question is, where does uh, cleanup, when cleanup is done, where do the pollutants go? Well, it depends on the pollutants. Um, some pollutants go to, uh, there are various classes of landfill that they can be um, provided. Uh, you know, one of the issues is if there's hazardous waste that has to go to a certain area. If there is, let's say that construction and um, demolition debris can go in one type of, it really just kind of depends on the character of what gets cleaned up. Now the Bramlett site, I'm not sure exactly where, it's, it's probably going to depend on the, the contamination levels when it's excavated as to where it's going to go. But like, for instance, one of the cases we're working on right now relates to uh, the Savannah River site and what's planned to take place there in the coming years. And that transuranic waste has to go across the country um, to the uh, waste. Uh, it's basically a, a waste disposal for radioactivity in New Mexico. Uh, so it really kind of depends on exactly what kind of pollutants you, you've got. Let's see. Okay. And then there was one other one. Do citizens contact DHEC for testing information if they're wondering about the content in their water? 
You certainly can. Uh, I think DHEC had one of the reasons, one of the things we did when we were working with the legislature trying to get PFAS addressed is we got them to allocate some money for testing. And DHEC has done a lot of testing of water systems. Now, you know, a lot of the water systems, there are some testing numbers on DHEC's website. Um, if, you, if you're talking about a, a well, a private well that provides drinking water, then yeah, I'd encourage you to contact DHEC uh, about that. And it, and it may depend on where you are in relation to a potential source of PFAS. So uh, certainly you can try uh, DHEC, but they, you know, certainly they don't have money to just test everywhere. Uh, but if you if it's a private well situation, I, I suggest maybe reaching out to them. If it's if you're on um, public water or county water or what some other authority provides you water, a lot of those have been tested or are being tested, and you can check DX website for some of those sampling results uh, or call your provider to see what information they have. I know that some of the sampling was done. 2019 2020 range and some of the some of that testing is above the current MCLs. I, I believe that some of the water systems have been working, uh, seeing what's coming down from EPA on PFAS have been working to try and get out in front of the issue uh, with in, in increased or more sophisticated filtration to try and get some of that out of the water because they are they knew they were going to have to comply with an MCL before long. Let's see here. One of the issues of um, the pollutants and where they're going to be put after they, uh, an area is, is cleaned up is our landfills. And where are our landfills located? Exactly. So it's a catch-22. Well, exactly. And, you know, the landfill, you got land, and that's that certainly raises environmental justice concerns. And, you know, the landfill aspect of it, too, is, okay, well, what do you want us to do with some of these pollutants? Well, you know, the, the, the landfill, that whole idea behind landfills is if, if the pollutants can be isolated uh, from getting out into the world and affecting people. Yeah, and landfills, there are lining requirements today. There weren't back when they filled Gadsden Creek. That's one of the issues. But that is to separate it, and then the leachate can be um, addressed in wastewater treatment plants, uh, while the rest of the, the materials degrade and eventually become inert or treated. All right, so uh, I got a, just a little bit more time left. Let me see if I, I missed some of these. I know. We've got, let me see. I think I can give our website. It should just be org. That should work. Um, let's see here. Sir, do you all do public service announcement of environmental justice issues throughout the state? People, uh, I don't know. I would say probably the best place to do that would be our social media. Uh, we do a lot of um, public publicizing uh, efforts and issues throughout the state there. And that's how you can find out what's going on, what we're working on. Uh, it's probably the easiest way anyway. Now, of course, we'll have our newsletter. We do a newsletter every quarter. And that provides kind of updates on what we've been working on and where things are. But as far as quick updates, that sort of thing. I will say, you know, print media, like for instance, the PFAS issues in Darlington and elsewhere around the state have been pretty extensively reported in the state newspaper. And, you know, I've talked a lot to Sammy Fretwell. He does a great job. And I know he's working on, has been working on this for a long time. So uh, some of the, the media will pick up on this and report on it too. But, but certainly we're monitoring that. And also sometimes we can, we're, we're in front of the media and trying to get them interested in certain issues. Yeah, I see it's 11, any other, let's see. Williamsburg County, where do you find that for water is safe for drinking? I would uh, contact your water provider if you have a water provider first. Uh, if you do not, if you're on a private well, then I think you should probably get it tested. 
um, if you have concern, any particular concerns. Um, the, if you have a water provider, they're supposed to be providing some of the testing results and they should, should be to DHEC and you can FOIA, if you, if you want, you can FOIA, which is submit a Freedom of Information Act request to DHEC for uh, any uh, results from sampling that your water providers had. DHEC requires the water providers to provide uh, sampling results to them so that they can verify that the water meets the criteria of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So, so anyway, uh, thank you all. It's 1101. I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome here, but thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you and Sorry about this kind of orange glow about me. Uh, <laughs> it's in the lighting in here in my office at my house. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and, and your interest. And this is really great to have an organization like y'all as, as big and broad and, and powerful as you all interested in such an important topic that, that we deal a lot with. So thank you. Then... I would like to thank you on behalf of the South Carolina Conference, uh, United Women of Faith, for sharing this informative, eye-opening information to us. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of ideas about what we can do to become involved and, and be a part of the work that the South Carolina Environmental Law um, project is working on, and we really appreciate everything your organization does for our communities throughout the state. And we thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning and share this important information. Thank you so, so much. It's my pleasure. We'll stay in touch. <laughs> Let us know when there's an issue we can get involved with you, <laughs> with I the will. state legislature. <laughs> I will do that. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of the time, like for instance, our uh, petition for rulemaking, we had a lot of community groups, interfaith, uh, power and light, uh, other types of uh, religious organizations, because this is a, a big topic for a lot of them, and obviously like Cajun. So there are definitely opportunities to work together, and uh, I'm happy to hear you say that. Okay. Um, after hearing all this information, we thought we would uh, give our members an opportunity for some discussion time. If you'd like to discuss um, what we've learned this morning and maybe ways we can address it and what actions we can take and how we can share the information with others. So I'm going to ask if you'd like to make a comment um, that you do your um, icon hand raise and I'll call on you and um, we'll just do some brainstorming here about what we can do. I'm happy to sign off if you want me to or I can stay on whichever you prefer. Uh, it, you're welcome to stay, but if you have other things to do, that's fine too. We really appreciate okay. you being with us. Well, I hear my four-year-old <laughs> hollering, so I'm gonna go help my wife. So thank you all. All right, Ben, thank you so much. All right, bye. Bye. Okay, Crystal Bars. Yeah, I'm just wondering if they have legislation that is coming up to be voted on or something. Can we not do the postcard send out things, signing and stuff like that? I mean, we already do some of that, but is it enough? Um. I'm thinking if there's a particular issue that's coming up and especially, you know, not even the state legislature, but also the cities yeah, where, where all this is going on. And from what I'm hearing from representatives, they say the best way to um, address them is through emails. And I've we been can, we, doing that with the ones in my area. I mean, I hear back from them, but I there's I don't get any follow up. Yeah, but you know, if there's a particular issue in an area around the state, and if y'all want to connect with one of these organizations he was talking about, like Friends of Gaston Creek or Denmark Cares, or you know, any organization we find out about that's dealing with a local issue, that's one of the ways we could probably help is to um, join with them in if somebody can coordinate and advocating yes. the postcards. Yeah, that. Yeah. Well, that's one way. 
<laughs> and yeah, it, if it if you have ideas, please share them. Um, okay, Deborah Schuler. Yes, I was thinking this after hearing him talk, it would be great to put in their district uh, newsletters and the mission echo every quarter some information about uh, environmental justice and what's going on, possibly from his newsletter that affects each of us in our own districts to keep people informed. Yes. I think that's good too. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. So, and, and I've been, the past year or so, I've been personally involved with the South Carolina Environmental Law Project as far as following the work they're doing. So, you know, if we keep in touch with them through their website, then maybe there's issues that we can um, find to include in our newsletters. I think that's a great idea. Yes. Okay, anybody else want to make a comment or a suggestion? Please be sure you share the recording. Let um, your units know. They might want to do it for a monthly program. Um, Carrie Murray? Uh, yes, I just wanted to share that Columbia District um, is planning to focus on climate justice at our annual meeting. And so the information that we received today, plus one of the books on our reading list, Can We Save? I think that's it, um, uh, will give us um, a great deal of information. And so we're going to, we're thinking of creative ways to share this information with the ladies in the Columbia District. And that will be shared with them at our. September 16th annual meeting, which all of you are invited to attend. <laughs> it will be it will be in person at Grace United Methodist Church. Okay, Carrie, thanks for that information and the invitation. And we will be addressing environmental issues um, at the conference annual meeting also in October. So that's going to be our main workshop for that event. Um, any other comments? Okay, well, the one comment I would like to make of is thank all of y'all for showing up and participating and you had excellent questions to ask our speaker. So I'm excited about your interest in it. And I hope that you know, we can make this grow and because I feel like environment is something that maybe our conference hasn't addressed that much. So maybe this will be like a springboard for us to get more involved with it. Uh, Judith Polson. Yes, um, before we leave, um, I just wanted to put in a plug for being active worldwide. Um, I have a deep concern about Israel, Palestine and the Palestinians get very bad water and it's not fair to them at all so if you're interested you can research that thanks okay thanks for sharing that um so if we don't have any other comments to make i'm going to pass this on to our social action coordinator patricia armstrong for some comments He did a great job. A lot of what he shared was very eye-opening. Um, so I do appreciate us having this opportunity to have this program. And um, as it was suggested, hopefully everyone will share the recording with, with your unit or even others that are not a part of your unit, but you know that they may have this interest. Certainly our, our young adults. They are very interested in the care of, of the earth and nature in general. So this may be an excellent opportunity, maybe even for um, a vacation by the school or a youth Sunday school um, to share this information. Um, so at this time, I'm going to also read our statement um, regarding uh, expectation as 
United Methodist. As United Methodists, we therefore are called to participate in God's creation through acts of personal, social, and civic righteousness, proclaiming and modeling a new lifestyle rooted in stewardship and justice. We work toward the day when all God's children respect and share in the goodness of creation. Uh, I would also like at this time to take an opportunity to point out to you all that by participating in this program, you have earned one of the credits toward the Diamond Unit. Um, that's number five, or number 17. The number five actually has a diamond. Um, designated ad as one designating that as one of the ones that um, can be used and gives you credit for attending a diamond program so number five on that diamond unit award is the one that you want to mark for this program if you already have one that you have done for that particular one number five then you can use this one for number 17 and i thank you for this opportunity That's it, Ms. Kathy. And Asley Dickey will close us in prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, Heavenly Father, we come humbly to you this day. Let us remember that you made the heavens and the earth and it was good. And you commanded us to take care of your creation to be good stewards. Father God, we're mindful of pollution, waste disposal, climate change, global warning, warming, greenhouse effects, we're mindful of water and wetlands, landfills, nuclear and toxic, toxic waste, rural drinking water contaminated, wildlife and habitat conservation, coastal management, among other things. We know, Father God, that we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. So therefore, we will be mindful of others their lives and their circumstances. As you create in us clean hearts with right minds, we honor you creator God and all things you have made. Bless all the units on the line today and especially the Charter for Racial Justice Committee who thought it not robbery to share this good news. Creator God, allow us to continue to use our resources and become a blessing to others, not just in South Carolina, not just in these United States, but all over the world. For you, Father God, have made us all, and we will never defile your scriptures of truth. We will never be deceitful in how we live, and we will give you the honor and glory and hallelujah praises in your son Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. amen.